next gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, a lady who was at the last meeting actually receiving an award uh, from me. She was uh, awarded a Sir Patrick Moore Prize for her outreach work, uh, talking to many different societies and groups, and um, she's got a blog and um, a YouTube channel all about astroimaging, Mary McIntyre, and uh, we're very pleased that she's been able to come today uh, to uh, give us the lowdown on what we can expect to see in the sky in the next few weeks. So please welcome Mary. Oh, I've got the graveyard shift again. <laughs> but there are some incredible observations that I'm going to be sharing with you during today's Sky Notes, and I'm going to point out a few things that you can look for yourself as well. I'm going to start with the sun, as this is not my photograph, I wish it was. Um, but I think you've just learned from the last talk how important it is to do regular solar observing and recording of um, just sunspot groups and flares, prominences, all of that type of thing. Now we're well into solar cycle 25. It seems like it's been so long coming for it to kind of be really active, but we've had some really beautiful active regions recently. So on the 14th of December, these three regions rotated and unfortunately they were gone before Christmas, but I think I was clouded out then anyway but they were beautiful. So these pictures are by Philippe Tosi, and again, showing the side-by-side -side comparison of hydrogen alpha versus white light. I think it's a bit of a misconception that white light solar stuff is a bit stagnant and not as dynamic, because as you saw from those drawings in the previous talk, sunspots evolve and change constantly, and it may not do it over as short a period of time as you see in hydrogen alpha. But what you're looking at in hydrogen alpha images is that kind of the chromosphere of the sun, the, the sun's atmosphere. So you get all of this beautiful kind of swirling gas, essentially, and the bright plages here. And sometimes you can pick up flares amongst that as well. And just putting the two side by side, I think, is really interesting. But white light is still good as well, because if you've got a good setup, you can get these things called faculi. They're closely connected to what's going on up in the chromosphere. And you can see granulation as well. Uh, I remember when I first started solar imaging, I'm like, my images are so noisy. And, you know, that, that is granulation. And actually, if you do a really magnified view of that and time lapse it, you can see the solar surface bubbling away. Just all of these huge convection cells. So these regions were absolutely stunning. Um, this picture again by Philippe Tossi, close up of that the day after on the 17th of December, and this is just so beautiful. <laughs> um, I could look at this all day, I really could, and I do when I got my PST. Um, this is from Stuart Green in Lancashire, my hometown, so hi Stuart. Um, this is another beautiful white light image of those same active regions as they were kind of working their way across the disk. And again, loads of faculi visible here, these really bright kind of worm-like structures and loads of granulation. And actually, if you've got a really active sunspot, you can sometimes see some of that magnetic field shape within the granulation. And very occasionally, a white light flare will peep through. I've definitely done that myself, where you just get this little poking white thing coming out of the middle of the sunspot. Not had it very often, but it can happen. And again from Stuart, this is looking at the difference between hydrogen alpha and calcium K. I like calcium K because it's purple. <laughs> I don't actually have a calcium K telescope myself, but what they're really good at looking at, I believe visually you can't really see that much, but on images you really see these plage areas, which are obviously very active regions, disruption of the kind of magnetic field within the sun. But also in hydrogen alpha, you get the filaments and prominences as well, which you don't see in calcium K. So it's really good to look at stuff in all of these different wavelengths. 
Um, Gary Palmer is an amazing solar imager and this picture is just sensational. Um, I love colour images of the sun and whenever I sketch the sun I do it in coloured pastels. But the next picture by Gary is making me want to crack my pencils out so badly and draw this because it is stunning. The amount of detail in these active regions, I mean I, I could talk about this picture for an hour and not get bored, you probably would. Um, so that's beautiful. Um, uh, there was another couple of active regions came into view at the end of December and I managed to image a couple of them myself and so did Ella Bryant. This um, picture again, you can see all the plages around the sunspots, but you also get them where there are no kind of labelled active regions as well. So it's very, very dynamic. Um, Michael Stefan also imaged those regions in white light and in calcium K. Again, just really nice to just compare and contrast the two. And it's fun to draw them as well when you draw the two different lights and see how different those pictures look. Now, my pictures are nowhere near as good as those, but um, there were quite a few smaller active regions that appeared in the second week of January. Now, as you just heard, I won the BAA prize, the Sir Patrick Moore prize last year, and I used that money to buy a little portable Altaz mount for outreach purposes. I was playing with that and realized that I could get the sun from part of my garden where I can't normally do it from the telescope here or our observatory. And just by complete coincidence, I was imaging on this day. This picture was taken at 12.38. At 12.36, a solar flare went off just on the limb. <laughs> it was from a region that hadn't yet been numbered. Um, our PST is quite old, so I'm not getting the contrast that I used to get. But the fact that the first picture I took with the mount I bought with that prize money was a solar flare. I'm really happy with that. <laughs> I think that's amazing. And those other smaller regions, although they're not as impressive as the previous ones, again, it's just interesting to look at them in white light and H-alpha. And the, it's hard to see on this picture, but there are actually, the, oh, there was a huge prominence um, region just here as well. It's not showing up very well on this screen, but the, there's been a lot of prominence activity during the week that I was imaging as well. So please do keep those solar observations coming in and please have a go at drawing it because drawing's amazing and you learn so much more than taking pictures. Now obviously closely linked with solar activity is aurora activity. And from somebody that is an aurora observer from mid-latitude, again, it has been a long time since we've had any hint of a chance of getting anything from down south. I keep pressing the wrong button. <laughs> So in November, there were seven solar storms. So uh, having gone from almost nothing to that is really amazing. And out of that, there were 11 reported aurora sightings um, from BAA members. And I'm going to show you some photographs in a minute. There was, in December, there was one R1 class solar storm. I was out imaging all night, but it just didn't reach where we were in North Oxfordshire. And there were no other sightings either. I think the weather was really against us in December. But during January, there were two solar storms, and actually this morning my phone went off again, alerting us to some heightened solar activity. So keep an eye on the apps, because we may get something tonight as well. But there were several aurora sightings coming from that. Now in no November, I did get some aurora pictures from Oxfordshire, but it was just the tiniest hint, so I'm not showing those today. But these pictures that I'm showing you are fantastic. This is Jim Henderson from Aberdeenshire, absolutely beautiful aurora arc there um, with the silhouette of a house it's just so lovely it's so nice to see this again after so long of not having much going on now this picture will probably be showing up better on the live stream than in here but this was taken from Swansea so it's not that different in latitude from where I am and it just shows that it is actually possible to see aurora from these regions but it's not going to look like those day glow green pictures that we see on Facebook all the time it's very often colorless there will be you can actually see pillars here there are just a couple of little pillars and there was definitely a green band there so if you are mid-latitude just get your camera out and point it north if there's been an aurora alert I've picked stuff up from KP6 upwards but obviously you need a negative BZ for it to be visible this far south this is from Stuart Baldwin, also in South Wales. And again, this is just beautiful. And you've even got reflection of the aurora in the lake, which is just so pretty. But lots of kind of 
pillars going on there. And actually above the green, there's a very clear purple band as well, which is different levels of excitation of the molecules in the atmosphere. So very, very beautiful. And finally, Tracy Harty from North Wales, Penryn Bay. This is a really beautiful picture. I bet she was so angry at this band of cloud. <laughs> I certainly would have been, but it's a really beautiful picture all the same. Just being that bit further north really makes a difference. So yeah, definitely keep an eye on the apps and just give it a try because quite often, even if you can't see something visually, your camera will pick stuff up. And I personally find that just keep shooting continuously and making a time-lapse video will reveal movement of aurora that you might not have seen on a single shot. So just get a big memory card and just keep shooting because you never know, you might get something. Um, the Shetland webcams, and Sandra wanted me to let you guys know, um, I think most of us will be familiar with Cliff Cam 3, which in the summer is like loads of beautiful seabirds nesting and in the winter is pointing north for aurora. There are now two new webcams, one at the SNS Lighthouse and one at Borough Firth, and they are both dedicated Aurora cameras further north, pointing north. So if those of you that don't have a good northern horizon or from a latitude that can't possibly see Aurora, that would be a good place to go if we see that there is an Aurora alert going on. And if you do spot Aurora, please let Sandra know. It's really important that we gather this information. Now, also in Sandra's section is noctilucent cloud um, in, uh, reports, and currently the Southern Hemisphere are having their noctilucent cloud season, or so they should be. Um, as somebody that is obsessed with noctilucent clouds, I feel so bad for them because it's been a really slow start this year. Normally, it's from mid-November through to about mid-February for, for those guys, but it, this year, it didn't start until the 14th of December, and even when it did, it really wasn't anything much to write home about, and as far as I'm aware, there still haven't been any actual visual sightings of NLC from down south. And now, you rarely get as many sightings down there as we do in the north, simply because there isn't as much land mass with people living on it, but even so, it's, um, it's really frustrating for those people. Part of this is because the winter conditions in the stratosphere persisted longer than normal. There is this zonal wind that needs to change direction to an easterly direction in order for that kind of summer weather to happen. Noctilucent clouds cannot form if the mesosphere is warmer than minus 120-ish. And that can't happen unless it's warmer lower down because that brings the cooling air upwards and it's the opposite way around to where you might think and so that's part of the reason why and that wind changed direction on the 13th of December and the next day some noctilucent clouds started to form. You do also need a source of water and when the sun's more active the UV radiation breaks down what little water there is in the mesosphere so there could be a couple of things happening here. I'm not an expert on stratospheric mesospheric weather patterns but I really hope that these guys get a little bit more going on because noctilucent clouds are amazing. This was the, from the AIMS satellite. It goes around the North Pole when it's our season, around the South Pole when it's their season. This is the most recent picture I could get yesterday and this was from Tuesday and there is a little bit more going on now. The picture from the 17th had like three little tiny groups on it. So hopefully this is gonna pick up and those guys will get some more sightings. So if any of our members are in the Southern Hemisphere, keep looking and let us know if you see anything. So moving on to the moon, I photographed myself on the 10th of December, a daytime International Space Station transit of the moon. It still blows my mind that with a small refractor and a high frame rate camera, you can pick up the space station against the background sky in daylight. I, I, did, I set up for this not thinking I was going to get anything because I used transitfinder.com. My laptop said it was going to miss. My phone said it wasn't going to miss. So I didn't know which one it was going to be. So I just did it anyway. And there's this tiny bit of the moon got transited plus the shadow side. But there are kind of 60 images here that had the ISS in them. And it's just incredible that you can do that in the daytime. Not sure how well it will show up, but just to show how fast this is. Basically, it transits the entire moon in less than a second. Um, I don't know how well that's showing up, but it's, 
It's a challenging thing to do. Honestly, I blog when I'm doing this normally. You can see the stress emanating from my body. And does it matter if I don't get it? Not really, but I think it's a really fun thing to do. It's one of the few satellites I'm not unhappy about seeing. So there we go. Um, on the subject of the ISS, I had to share this tweet because this is hilarious. Obviously, we all know about the huge volcanic eruption that happened in Tonga, and effects of this were photographed from the space station. But apparently, in order to get these pictures, one of the astronauts opened the window. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did they do that on live stream? Because it's something they're only going to do once. Um, which, coming from a <laughs> coming from a NASA astronauts' Twitter page, is quite a mistake to make. I'm sure they meant open the window blind or cover, but I thought that was really funny, um, so I had to put that in. Um, but talking about the moon, just to go through what the phases are going to be in the next couple of months, we've got the new moon on the first of the month, on the first of February. Then the first quarter on the 8th, full moon on the 15th, no super moon as far as I'm aware, and then last quarter on the 23rd of February. These are pictures that I created using the NASA um, visualization tool, which I'll show you the web address for in a second. It's really good for showing you exactly what the moon is going to look like at any time and date. And then on the 2nd of March, we've got another new moon, and then first quarter again on March the 10th, and then the 18th of March, a full moon, and then last quarter again on the 25th. And I think it's like the 2nd or 3rd of April that we've got another new moon. So one of the things I like to do with that visualization tool is look for when these different Claire Obscure effects are going to be vis visible. I'm sure two years ago when I did Sky Notes, I talked about the Lunar X because I'm a bit obsessed with it, to be honest. It's just so sweet. I like many Claire Obscure effects, but if you can't see them, the X and the V, these are great for outreach because suddenly there's a letter X and a letter V on the moon and they kind of show up in the shadowy part of the moon. Up close, these are some pictures that I took which are not showing up very well on here, but the V is here, but you can see the X there. When you get in close, you can see it's not a solid X at all because this is just sunlight reflecting off the, the rims of four different craters and there are little nibbles taken out of it. But it's really interesting to just watch how this forms. And I think this video I created a couple of years ago, where over time, just over six hours, I photographed the same part of the moon just to show how, um, oh, it's going to play once and that's it. Um, but it just shows how quickly the region around the Terminator actually changes. I think there's a temptation to just go out, get some pictures of the moon, go back in again. But if you go back out two hours later, the whole landscape near the Terminator can have changed drastically. And if you've got kind of a sunrise over a crater, the shadows are changing all the time, they're beautiful to sketch. It's worth just spending a few hours in a night just going back to the same regions and seeing how things have changed. Another one that I really like is the face in Albategnius, and this is visible two hours after the lunar X and V are visible, which is on the 8th of February, I forgot to say that before. So the X and the V will be visible about um, 1700 UT. The face in Albategnius is visible for a short time, and the shadow, you can just make out here, it looks like that's an eye, then there's a nose and a mouth. It's quite creepy, and it's a great example of pareidolia, where the human brain assigns human characteristics to random things. And it is quite weird when you just see this kind of side profile shadow of a face. So that's a really good one to look for. And one more that I really like is the eyes of Clavius. And this is super easy to find because, of course, Clavius is the biggest crater on the near side. And if you get this at 11 o'clock or 2300 UT on February the 9th, you will just see, it's not showing up on the picture, but the two craterlets um, within Clavius, the outer rims are just that little bit higher and they catch the sunlight before the crater floor and it looks like these two creepy eyes looking out of this shadowy void and it's um, another great one for outreach if you can convince people to be up at 11 o'clock which is a challenge um, but it's it's really worth just again looking at that over time and seeing how that crater has changed over the sunlight so the tool that I use to look for these is the SVS NASA tool the so-called dialer moon and this you can just put in the the month date and time it only does it down to the nearest hour but that's usually close enough and it will show you what the moon looks like at exactly that point 
And, and it's worth bearing in mind that you can do this. It shows the moon as it would be from space. So the moon may not be visible from your location when you find these effects, but those are the ones that are definitely visible from the UK. So that's the moon. There, um, I'm going to move on to the planets. And I'm going to talk about a couple of lunar planetary conjunctions in a minute. But first of all, there's been quite a lot of stuff going on on Jupiter. There was a convective outbreak in the northern equatorial belt, which is usually a relatively quiet region. And this was imaged by lots of BAA members, and I've got some great images to show you. But by a complete coincidence, Juno on um, Perigeo 38 actually kind of flew over and imaged that same region. So on the Juno cam pictures, you can actually see a close-up of the cloud plume that was the result of that outbreak. And you can go and download any of the Juno images yourself and just process them, and it is incredibly good fun because most people from their back garden are not going to get that level of detail on Jupiter, so it's really, really good to go and play with those pictures. Now, Perigeo 39 was on the 19th, uh, sorry, the 12th of January, and it imaged exactly the same region again, so it'll be really good to compare the two um, sets of images, but they've been really slow to come down, so there are, there are no pictures in this from that. But these pictures are taken, um, they, they were sent to me by the Jupiter section. You can just see these outbreaks here, these kind of bright regions that were otherwise in a very quiet equatorial belt region. So this is the northern equatorial belt. And these images started to be taken before the Perigeo's um, 38 data. So it was really great that they overlapped. And this is just showing the evolution of those regions over different nights by lots of different observers. So again, just shows the importance of having everybody imaging Jupiter at the same time, because you can put this stuff together. If you've got clouds, somebody else might not have, and you can build up this really beautiful picture. This is a close-up picture of that cloud plume from Juno Cam, and it was so beautiful. Again, makes me want to crack my pastel pad out and do some drawing because that is just gorgeous. So the other picture that we've got here is taken around the 9th and 10th of January, and five different Jupiter observers again spotted another outbreak in the northern equatorial belt, and that is Io the smallest um, nor the nearest orbiting moon around Jupiter, and I think that is Io's shadow. And then over here, we've got one of the other um, kind of storm regions that's not far from the Great Red Spot. But what's interesting about this picture is if you look, the, the arrow there, the black arrow, is showing where Juno went on Perigeo 39. So it's going to pretty much go right over the top of where that new outbreak is and the equatorial region being there. So it'll be really interesting to look at those images when they do come down, and it'll be very, very interesting to just compare the two. But it's really important for ground-based people to be looking at Jupiter in this detail and looking for these outbreaks because Jupiter is is not a still world. There's a lot that changes all the time. If you want to find Jupiter tonight, you need to kind of look over in the southwest. It's very low now, but it's still pretty bright, and you will see it low down, kind of south, uh, west-southwest sort of region. You can't miss it because all the other stars there are quite faint. So that's where Jupiter is. But if we look a little bit further up there, we also have Uranus. I think technically it's just within the realms of naked eye visible, but generally most observers will need binoculars or a small telescope to see it. But you will see it there. Obviously, wait till the moon's out of the way because it will bleach the sky so much that you won't be able to see anything. So this is actually how the sky will look tonight. So if you go out tonight at 6.30, this is kind of where everything will be placed. That was so beautiful, I accidentally put it in twice. <laughs> Um, Uranus is another world. Obviously, a lot of people can't image this sort of detail on Uranus, but Luigi Marone sent this um, observation in. And this is showing a really bright region in the northern um, part of Uranus. It's this kind of outbreak of bright region. I don't understand that much about Uranus, I'm sorry. Um, but you can see that this, this has been there a while, and this recent observation shows that that new bright region is still visible. So again, these gas giants are not static worlds. There's all these other things going on there. So that is an incredible observation. I can't even comprehend getting a picture of Uranus like that myself. So thank you so much for sending that in. 
Now, Neptune is also kind of not far from Jupiter. Um, so this is what it will look like at 7 o'clock tonight, so a bit further up in the sky, and there are some kind of constellation lines on there to give you a bit of, uh, a bit of navigation, so it's kind of just up above Aquarius. So again, Neptune, definitely going to need binoculars or a telescope to spot that. Now, Jupiter is going to be slipping down towards the horizon during February, and by the time we get to the beginning of March, it's heading towards solar conjunction, which means we won't be able to, to view it because it'll be too near the sun. So solar conjunction is on the 5th of March, and Saturn is also heading towards solar conjunction on the 4th of February, so it's not the best time for the gas giants, unfortunately. And then on the 13th of March, Neptune is also in solar conjunction. So you'll be able to see Neptune during February, but by the middle of March it's going to have slipped down too much and get lost in the solar glare. But you can still spot them if you go out like now. <laughs> You'll get a, a look at some of those. If you want a really beautiful conjunction, you can look on the 3rd of February and a couple of day old crescent moon will join Jupiter low down in the southwest. I always think that crescent moon and planet conjunctions are really photogenic, especially if you expose long enough to get Earth shine. They're just so pretty. So that will be a really nice one to look for. Moving over into the dawn sky, if you like being up at five to six, which I do not, but <laughs> it would be worth getting up because Venus is going to be very low but very, very bright in the, the coming weeks. And you may, if you've got a very, very clear horizon and no light pollution, you might just get a tiny glimpse of Mars, but Mars is going to be a challenge, to be honest. And... Venus and Mars here on the 20th of March. Venus on that date actually will be around about mag minus 4.7. So th this is the time of Venus's apparition where people start calling in UFO reports because the people are just not used to seeing Venus looking that bright. But Mars will be just below it. Um, so it is at greatest western elongation on the 20th of March. It's not going to be very high in the sky. You're going to need a low horizon, but you really will not be able to miss it because it's going to be so so bright and again this is mercury joining the pair this is going to be a challenge this is going to be very much near the solar glare so please don't try this if you don't know what you're doing because it's going to don't point binoculars where the sun's about to rise above the horizon but we've got this lovely triangle of venus mars and mercury this is on the 16th of february and that is the date mercury is at greatest western elongation during march mercury is not visible at all as you can see it's already pretty close to the sun here so not the best time for Mars and Mercury, to be honest, but you may just be lucky to catch a little glimpse of them. Um, another conjunction that I thought was worth mentioning is I, I think the Hyades cluster doesn't get enough love. I think it's a lovely cluster and there's a lot of stars in it. You think of it as this little arrowhead, but there's over 100 stars in the Hyades cluster and it's very pretty. But the moon, when it's almost half full, is going to sit right between the Hyades and the Pleiades. And that is going to be on the 9th of February. So I think that is another photo opportunity. And that's just a really nice alignment. I, I really like the moon when it's near clusters like that. Another thing to look out for here is the Winter Milky Way. And... I don't think the Winter Milky Way gets enough love either. It's not showing up very well on here, but you can see the band of the Milky Way throughout winter. Obviously, it's nowhere near as impressive or as beautiful as the Summer Milky Way, but if you point your binoculars at it, you will just be tripping over yourself with deep sky objects. There are so many clusters, nebulae, so much stuff going on within that band. And there's all the gas and dust and all the background stars. And you can just get lost in it. It's really pretty. And over in the kind of late night, early morning sky in the east, we've now got Leo getting quite high. So you've got galaxy season starting. So while there's not a lot going on in terms of bright stars in that part of the sky, we've got Ursa Major and Leo really high just, again, teeming with galaxies, so absolutely loads to choose from. Now, I did take a picture of the Winter Milky Way, which is um, not going to show up very well on this screen, 
But yes, it's not as impressive, but it, just getting that whole arch of the Milky Way going over here from my back garden. I want to do this again because the tree that you can just see behind here got taken out by a tornado on Halloween. Um, there were 11 tornadoes in Oxfordshire and um, Northamptonshire on the morning of Halloween. One of them went directly over our house. And there is a video on my YouTube channel of that huge tree going down and then us ducking as part of our roof got ripped off. So the, that one is safe for work. The version on Facebook is not because it was frankly terrifying. <laughs> so I've always wanted to see a tornado or a funnel cloud. I no longer ever want to see one again because it was really scary. <laughs> but I think it will give me a better outlook on this picture because there's a huge tree gone from our skyline now. So, moving on to variable stars, Novacast 2021, or V1405 pass, has been the, the Nova that keeps on giving, quite frankly. So, this was discovered in March last year, on the 18th of March. Now, remember, I actually had a photograph of this from a couple of days before the discovery was announced. And I've got the progenitor star just faintly there and... It, it did get brighter a couple of days later. But it is still, I, I love how astronomers say it's quite bright at 10th magnitude. <laughs> but in astronomical terms, with the equipment that most of us have now, that is definitely achievable. It is fading, and this is the, the light curve from that variable star. And it's been really interesting. There's loads and loads of peaks and troughs here. And I think the reason for that is it's a very dusty nova. So as dust obscures things, they get dimmer, and then it clears, and they get brighter again. But the trend is now definitely going downwards. But all of these people have contributed to this light curve. And again, it's just so important that when we've got these transient events, that as many people as possible are observing them, photographing them, doing photometry on them, and sending that information in. Because it's thanks to people doing that that we can do science like this so crucially important that we always do that um, this is a picture of Nova Cass from the 5th of January by Mike Harlow um, his markers were really faint so I've just added them again here so this is in a really pretty region of Cassia Pier where you've got the cluster M52 up there which is lovely but you may have spotted the bubble nebula down there as well this is such a gorgeous photograph it's in monochrome the original is really beautiful so yeah that nova is definitely achievable with most people's equipment so yeah keep going for that one um, on the subject of nova cast mike harlow's been doing some excellent um, spectroscopy using a prism spectroscope that fits on the objective lens this is incredibly difficult to do. I don't think people appreciate how difficult this is when you've got something that's essentially in the plane of the Milky Way and you have about 8 billion spectra in the same image. Um, but this is really interesting because it's showing loads of emission lines. With, this is actually Nova Cass's band here. And there's loads of emission lines in helium and hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, gamma, delta. There's just so much going on in there. And the original, you can see all of those um, emission lines. So it's really great if any of you do spectroscopy to follow up with this as well because it tells us a bit more about what's going on within that nova. Um, just a couple of days ago, the Astronomer's Telegram reported a possible nova in M31. That's not being confirmed as yet. It may have been this morning, but as of last night, I haven't seen any further confirmation. But it was independently discovered by two people on the 15th and 16th of January. I'm sorry, I forgot to write their names down and I can't remember. Um, so apologies for that. But these are pictures taken on the 15th and the 19th of January. And this is the, the nova that we're talking about. So it has definitely brightened between those two. So this is definitely one to get people imaging and see what develops. It may end up being a really impressive nova, it may not. I believe M31 has something like a dozen novae every year. Um, so this is obviously worthy of an astronomer's telegram, so it may be a bit brighter than some of the others. So yeah, again, just keep reiterating how important it is to just get photometric observations on these, these things. So moving on to asteroids, you probably will have seen all the excellent news reports about the near-Earth asteroid pass that we had recently. Um, we call it a, a close pass, but you'll see in a moment it wasn't really that close. Um, but it was, this is asteroid 7482, also known as 1994 PC1. 
That did a, a close pass of the Earth on Tuesday, on the 18th of January. This is a one kilometer diameter object and it came within five lunar distances. Now, bearing in mind how far away the moon is, that's not that close really, but you know, in astronomical terms, I guess it is. But it was actually the brightest near Earth object pass that we've had in five years. So a lot of people were out imaging it. And this excellent um, photograph here is from Peter Carson. This is 50 lots of 10 seconds showing how quickly that asteroid is moved through that field of view. So it was a pretty fast moving asteroid with it being that bit nearer. So always worth looking out for these because they are fun to do, like the James Webb telescope, just seeing these things moving so quickly against the background sky is really good fun. So comets, there are three comets of note at the moment. First of all, A1 Leonard, not in the Northern Hemisphere anymore. I'm not at all bitter about how it upped its activity when it left our skies. No, not at all. Um, it's still pretty bright at around Mag plus seven. Um, you're gonna see a photograph in a minute of what it looked like when it got to the Southern Hemisphere and I'm not bitter at all. Um, 67P Churumiof Goresimenko is still well placed. It's past perihelion now, but at mag plus 9.5, again, still achievable for most people. And how amazing it is to actually get a photograph of this famous comet that had the Rosetta mission that we followed so closely. Um, I'm not showing my picture of it because it's not really worthy of being shown, but the fact I've got a picture of this comet at all is just extraordinary. So that's definitely still worth observing and it's going to be well placed all month and we have another comma um, 2019 L3 Atlas it's actually very far away but it's a really big comma so that is around about mag plus nine so again that is definitely achievable so this is um, a picture that Mark and I took of Comet Leonard. We've actually learned to collaborate. I'm not as competitive with him as I used to be. He even had to build me my own pier because we got so competitive. But um, we've now been collaborating and we got these nice pictures. And this was really beautifully colored. And you know, it wasn't the best picture compared to some that I've seen online, but I was still really glad to have got a photograph of it at all. So that was on the 2nd of December. Uh, I'm, again, not at all bitter that it was cloudy on the, <laughs> the day after that, on the 3rd of December, when this comet was in conjunction with M3. And when I say in conjunction with, I mean really in conjunction with it. Seeing a comet's tail just going through a globular cluster like that, it's just extraordinary. Um, so yeah, this was taken from Morocco. It was clouded out throughout the whole UK as far as I'm aware. But even when it was approaching this object, the pictures that I was seeing online were just amazing. So I do love a deep sky object in conjunction with a comet. I, I just think it's beautiful. So this is from Ian Sharp, and this is another picture of A1 Leonard taken on the uh, 7th of December. And then this is what Leonard did when it went south. Um, this was taken from Namibia by Alan Tuch, and the, the structure in this tale was extraordinary. Quite a few people in the Comet Watch group have been doing time lapses of how this, it kind of had several outbursts and kicked out all these kind of knots of gas and dust. And the way that this tale was evolving every day was just extraordinary. It's like, why couldn't it have just done that a week earlier? I would have been very happy. But it, you know, it's great that we do have the ability to do these sort of remote images, and those are amazing. This is a picture of Comet 67P from Ian Sharp. Again, this was taken from Spain, and that was on the 7th of December. So this is still a pretty comet, and there, there are some nice conjunctions coming up that I'll point out. So 67P is currently in Cancer, and it's going to be kind of hanging around that region for the next month or so. So definitely achievable once the moon's out of the way, and it's not really going to move an awful lot against the background sky, so definitely worth looking for. But on the 9th, 9th of March, it's going to be really close, so you can't really see it very well, but that's the comet, and down here there's a galaxy, and there are two galaxies here, and from the sky live, um, they are elliptical galaxies, and having a comet sitting within the same field of view of those would be really pretty. Um, I, I just love a deep sky conjunction with a comet, so that'll be worth looking for. Um, on to Atlas, that is currently in Gemini, and on this is how it will be on the 1st of February. And Atlas is also going to have a really nice conjunction with a really beautiful cluster. This is NGC 2266. 
And as, as you can even see on this screen, it's got some very colorful stars in this cluster. And I think a comet near this cluster is gonna be really, really pretty. So that is the 31st of January. So let's hope for clear skies then because I, that's really close to that cluster. So I think that'll be really beautiful. So on to meteors, um, I've had to pull from our own resources here, so thankfully my husband and I are involved with a couple of different networks. Um, so we've had some really nice meteor showers. The Geminids was the 4th to the 20th of December, as most of you will know. And across the UK meteor network, we had over 9,000 single station detections, which is amazing, but you can't do a lot of science with a single station detection. But of those, 2,700 or so were actually matched events, and that's when you can start doing some science. And from that, we got 962 solved trajectories. And this is important work because it will kind of figure out increasing rates, it will tell you exactly where stuff's come from, it will look for resonances, so it's really interesting to kind of look at that data. I just love getting any meteor regardless of whether it's been matched, but I think from a science perspective this is great. The brightest that we had was MAG minus 3.99. This is a, a track stack from one of our own meteor cameras, and you can really see that not all, but most of the meteors on this picture are all going the same way. It's really clear that they belong to the same shower. Sporadic meteors will go in any direction. The ones belonging to a shower all seem to originate from the same point, and that is what was happening here with that lovely bright one there. This is from our radio detector, which sadly went offline the last six days of December, but it's fairly obvious where the peak of the Geminids was. Um, what you're looking at here is this is every day of the month going down, and this is every hour in a 24-hour period, 24 hour period. And each of these numbers is how many meteors per hour were being picked up on our radio meteor detector. Now, this is pointing towards the Grav signal, so this is not all sky by any means, but it really clearly shows shows that there was a, a bit of a peak this day and then on the 14th there was another peak there where we were getting around about 50 meteors per hour. There's another weird spike in activity down here as well but also the Ursids while not a particularly impressive shower you can clearly see the peak of the Ursids here as well on the, the 21st I think that was so these heat maps are really good for a quick glance at when all the activity was happening. We also had the quadrantids, which can also be an impressive shower. So the, this one's active from the 28th of December to the 12th of January. And again, a lot of single station detections, over 4,000, which led to 673 solved trajectories. And the brightest um, quadrantid that we picked up was MAG minus 2.9, which is very, very bright, very nice indeed. And a much smaller peak than the Geminids, as you'd expect, but this is clearly when the peak of the quadrantids happened. And that's not offline, we just haven't had the rest of January yet. <laughs> so these heat maps are really useful because obviously this is able to pick up meteors in the daytime and when it's cloudy. So it's a really good backup for the UK weather that we have in the winter. So this was a random, on the 7th of January, MAG minus 4.34 meteor, which was really bright. And this was picked up at 21.29. This was on one of the stations near Bath. Luckily, we caught that as well. And this turned out to be a Northern Chai Orionid. And this was moving at 23.6 kilometers per second. And the orbit solving of this says that it was probably a Trojan asteroid fragment. So I have a, a video of this, which hopefully will play. So this was a, a pretty impressive video to see on our, um, on our cameras. So really glad to pick those up. So that's the beauty of having these cameras that are recording all the time. So I'm just going to finish up. Those of you that saw me doing Sky Notes in 2020 will remember me kind of voicing my slight concerns over the situation with regards to satellite constellations. Well, things took an unexpected turn on the 15th of November when Russia decided to test their own anti-satellite system by basically blowing up one of their own satellites and creating a stream of debris that has 1,500 traceable pieces of debris, not to mention the ones that aren't traceable. And this has caused all kinds of issues. The Chinese satellite nearly collided with debris from some of that. And when we say close call here, we mean very close. We're talking 14.5 meters. 
if something like that hits another satellite, you get the Kessler syndrome happening very, very quickly. It's about the only part of the film Gravity that was accurate, I think. Um, <laughs> but it, it is a really worrying situation. That is not the way to get rid of a satellite. But then every country is blaming every other country at the moment for stuff that's happening with near misses because there was an out of control Chinese satellite nearly hit the ISS and actually they had to hide several times in the last month just get to safety because there was a probability of being hit they had to adjust their orbit and this is a big problem and then China was berating the US because one of their satellites nearly got hit by a Starlink satellite and so it's going to go on and just to give you a scale of where we're at with this, there are now 2,000 Starlinks in orbit, chuck in 100 up at a time, which is horrifying. The FCC have already approved another 29,500, but there are applications in for 65,000 more. On top of that, I've seen another paper where another company wants to make their own constellation that has over 100,000. This is going to be a major problem, and this is the kind of thing we pick up regularly now on our meteor cameras, where you get these huge streaks from satellites. Luckily, the software is fairly smart and can get rid of them, but from the professional observatories, this is going to be a huge problem. And the, um, the IOP, the, there was a, in their journal, there was a study done on the visibility predictions for the mega constellations that had been approved at that time, not even including all the new ones. And this is around 50 degrees latitude, which is where a lot of the professional observatories are. Look how many satellites are visible throughout the night. The ones that are in low Earth orbit tend to be brighter around just after sunset before sunrise. But the ones that are higher up are visible constantly throughout the whole pass and they're visible all night long. And yes, algorithms, stacking algorithms can remove the streak, but that is essentially lost data and you can't invent lost data. So this is a really worrying precedent that's being set here and I suspect in years to come people will look back at this in the same way that they look at us dumping radioactive waste in rivers in times gone by. I just, I don't see how this is going to end well for anybody. So anyway, sorry about that <laughs> for ending on such a bummer. Um, but yeah, please do look up and keep submitting your observations. And thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thank you very much, Mary. That's really a fantastic amount of detail you've gone into there. I I've prepared sky notes in the past and I know how much work it is it's hours and days work and I can see the you the detail you've gone into there it was a huge amount of work and I'm sure you couldn't all take it all in even if you were taking notes but you can watch it again on the YouTube stream I, I would say about the uh, satellite constellations it is obviously a thing that is very much on our radar on the BAA's radar and the BAA is part of a group consortium of uh, astronomical societies that is trying to lobby the UK government to do what it can to control satellite mega constellations. Obviously, it's a big international problem. It requires international action. It requires international agreement. But we are trying to get it on the, uh, on the radar of the government of um, of, this, of the science and technology ministers. So, uh, although it's a pessimistic thing, it's a, a thing that astronomy societies are trying to tackle. Any, any questions for Mary? Yes. Well, uh, no, they've been discussing the weather generally, and also, but they've also been they've also been commenting on the quality of the live stream, saying that the sound has been coming across very well and uh, good detail in the photographs. Uh, so, uh, well done. I, I I was amused by the uh, uh, anecdote about the International Space Station opening their windows. I mean, it's obvious why they did that, isn't it? They were complying with COVID guidelines. That's all it was. <laughs> so thank you very much, Mary, again.
So we have to vacate this uh, hall quite soon because they're having some sort of a shindig in here this evening, live music, which they want to set up. Uh, but there is a bar here, uh, so you may want to go and uh, hang around there and uh, talk about astronomy. I, I really would like to thank very much our streaming technician, uh, S.L. Chai, who has had to do a really difficult job uh, because we discovered that it wouldn't, wasn't possible to link directly to Zoom from the uh, PC on the lectern. So what he was actually doing was actually advancing the slides. He had a separate copy of all the slides on his PC, which was connected to, not Zoom, connected to YouTube. And he was advancing them in coordination with what was happening on the screen, as, as well as swapping the cameras over and making sure the sound was going. So that was really a complex job. And it all worked out very well. So uh, our next meeting, uh, live meeting, will be in March. Hope to see many of you there. And uh, good observing, clear skies for the rest of the winter and into the spring. Thank you.